Thank you all for coming. Welcome, Lois. The CEDEC conversation, the CEDEC initiative um, is a group of people within the JCA, like 50 people, who particularly wanted to do to understand more about the, the inequity, the racial inequities of our system that have been uncovered in such painful and shocking ways. And as we're all going deeper individually, we felt collectively it would be more powerful. And as we learn enough to, to take action, uh, to, to you know, be a voice and a boat to remedy inequities, um, we want to enlarge our leverage through working with more people. And first of all is learning. So we're inviting people to share their understanding with us as well as reading and watching and talking and listening to more diverse voices. Um, so we had our first with the co-founders of Racial Equity Amherst. And we have two later that I'll mention at the end. Uh, but today we're really delighted to have Lois Ahrens, the co-founder and director of the Real Cost of Prisons Project. The website and the Facebook page are mentioned in the chat resources. Um, just a little bit about Lois. Uh, she's from Brooklyn, home of many activists. And she uh, said that she has been an organizer for all of her adult life. That's been her work and one um, bounced around a little geographically, but came to the Valley 40 years ago. And really a organizer entrepreneur, I would say, because yeah. it's true, you started your own little thing because you, you had a bit of a grant money and you knew what you wanted to do and you just needed to find a, a kind of legal framework, which was provided by the sentencing project in Washington, DC. And then you got uh, started Real Cost of Prisons and it's grown and its impact and your uh, continued faithful nurturing and building the organization is uh, a tremendous gift to us. And um, many of us have paid no attention no attention to prisons in Massachusetts, except for the one on Route 2 that you see on your way to Boston. That was about it. So this whole uncovering, this racial reckoning we're going through um, has so many reverberations and understanding mass incarceration and um, policing, the whole, the framework uh, is our goal. So tell us about um, the state that we live in. That one of the fact sheet that you uh, gave out to us had when it comes to the criminal legal system, Massachusetts is not a progressive state. That's an amazing surprise for many of us. Um, and I'd also like to know what does real cost of prisons do and how do you have an impact? Um, <clears throat> well, yeah, I, I mean, that is the main thing that I want to communicate to everybody. And that is when it comes to the criminal legal system, Massachusetts is, if there is a curve and the curve or a line and it starts here and it goes here, Massachusetts is down here. So it's at the furthest lowest corner of all the states. And people are shocked to find out that it, many things it's worse than, you know, the demonized states of Mississippi and Texas and, you know, all the states that people in the Northeast love to hate. And, um, <clears throat> but when it comes to the criminal legal system, we are down there with them, sometimes even lower than them. And um, that's, I think, the main thing for you to know. And aside from the specifics and some of the specifics, certainly not all of them, I tried to put in that fact sheet, um, which I don't know if people looked at, but anyway, I'm sure you can look at it. And it's um, about the racial disparity. It's about the length of sentences. It's about life without parole. It's about conditions of confinement. And it's about the, um, the reticence, the stonewalling, the lack of interest, the racism of the legislature. And also, of course, the governor. And uh, our governors, I mean, Deval Patrick wasn't any different. Weld was not any different. I mean, Weld said at one point that 
he wanted prisoners in Massachusetts to learn to love the um, activity of breaking rocks. And um, <clears throat> so that's, but that is not really, I mean, he, he said it, but mm -hmm. it's not atypical. I mean, he articulated uh, what the rest of them have acted on. And so, um, so that, that's, I mean, the main thing I want to communicate to people um, in terms of um, how I started, um, I started in a way uh, kind of like you all, not knowing anything. And um, I started in the late 90s and actually um, Rail Coast Prince became an organization in 2000. So it's been 20 years. And um, I won't go into how it is exactly that I started doing it, but I, I did. And one of the things that I realized uh, when I started was, and I thought everybody would, would be able to see this the way I saw it, was that to me it was, uh, even back then, uh, the civil rights movement or the need for the continuation of the civil rights movement and the struggle for racial justice uh, because of who's locked up, who is criminalized, who ends up being policed, being um, hugely uh, disproportionately uh, black people, people of color, and poor white people. And um, those are the people that get trapped in the system, and those are the people uh, because of lack of because of their race and because of lack of access to money, um, get trapped for a lifetime. And when I named the real cost of prisons, the real cost of prisons, everybody thinks, oh, I'm talking about money, which I am partly talking about money, like what it costs all of us to do this to people. But uh, what I really, want people to look at is the real cost to human beings, the real cost to those human beings, families, kids, parents, um, the real cost to the communities where millions and literally millions and millions of people are extracted from those communities and put in jails and prisons. And then most of them sort of pumped out of those, those jails and prisons back into their communities um, where they, because of their criminal records, have, I mean, huge less access to everything, um, to jobs, to education, to housing, to, to um, to every, everything that people would need to actually try to rebuild their lives afterward and rebuild the lives of their families and rebuild their communities, which are eviscerated by mass incarceration. And so um, when I talk about the real costs, um, that's what I'm talking about. The, the real cost to people and families and communities. And uh, that's, that's how I see it. When I first started, I knew maybe a couple of people that had been in jail. And that was it. Um, and one of the first things that one of the first projects of the Real Cost of Prisons project was um, creating these three comic books, which you can see on, they're online. They're on the Real Cost of Prisons website. One's on the war on drugs, one's on the incarceration of women and their and the impact on their kids and their lives, and the others called Prison Town. And it's about building building prisons and what happens to the locations where the prisons get built, which are usually rural communities, this is all over the country, and what happens to the communities where all of these people are taken out of their communities and put 
um, in these prisons. And so it, that's that's what that one's about. And um, the first printing I did of them uh, was like I printed 5,000 of them. And by the time I, they basically came to my house, by the time they came to my house, I already had like 5,000 requests for them. And so I immediately had to start getting more printed and raising more money to print them. And in, in the end, um, I printed 135,000 of them. Mm -hmm. And um, and most of them got sent to people, like at least probably about 100,000 of them got sent to uh, people who were incarcerated. And uh, as soon as I started sending them out, I started getting all of this mail back and uh, and over time, I mean, like basically over well, more than 15 years now, um, I started corresponding with a lot of people and then also sometimes their families or their kids or, and some of those people, of course, are still in prison. Some of those people, thankfully, out of prison. Um, I started visiting people in prison and I, uh, I, I I always say that people always say, well, did you start out by having a loved one in prison? And I always say, no, I didn't. But now I have hundreds of loved ones in prison. And so my connection to people that are in prison is deep, <laughs> really, really deep. And um, and that is the thing that really drives what I do uh, because of my connection to people that are experiencing life inside and then also uh, experiencing life outside. And some of those people, actually almost all of the people that I know who've gotten out and have been out are doing remarkable work. They were doing remarkable work inside and they were now doing remarkable work on the outside. So um, that's really how I started. And that, um, that my connection to people inside and also once they came out and families uh, is the, the thing that has driven the areas of interest that I work on. Um, so uh, one of the big categories is conditions of confinement. And that's, that's everything about how people are kept locked in cages, which is how people are kept in cages. Like if you can try to wrap your mind around being in a cage for 50 years um, and the kind of control that people have over other people and uh, what happens to the people in the cages and what happens to the people that keep them caged, um, which is, you know, a whole other area of uh, what happens to the keeper and the cat. And um, so conditions of confinement is all about treatment. It's all, it's about solitary. I mean, there are thousands and thousands and thousands of people, at least 70,000 people in solitary every day. Every prison has solitary, every jail. So when you drive down Route 66 and you see that building up on a hill there, there are people in solitary in that building up on a hill. You know, they don't get the view. And um, so uh, solitary, um, what, what people get to eat or not eat, um, how much they spend or their family spend on telephones so that uh, they can communicate with each other, with their family members. Um, uh, every app, what you know? What kind of whether they whether they have 
clothes or not, whether they have enough money to buy something warm because the, a jail doesn't give them enough warm clothes. Um, all of those things have to do with um, conditions of confinement and also the brutality that people experience um, every day and the racism that people experience every day. Um, one of the one of the words that I don't use and I try to encourage people not to use is the word inmate, which is used constantly. And you know, people are called inmates. They are not called by their name. And they're sometimes they're called by their number. So they lose their names. And um, that that's a way of just uh, dehumanizing people, degrading those people. Um, and so it, to me, it's, it's, it's prison language, it's carceral language. And I really, um, I mean, not just me, but many, many, many formerly incarcerated people uh, try to get people to stop using these words. Uh, inmate, felon, offender, uh, people that, knit words that freeze people uh, based on this thing that they did a felon, you're always a felon, regardless of what, what happens to you, or an ex-felon, or uh, a parolee, not a person on parole. So all of this is part of the sort of dehumanizing language that the carceral system has just built into it. Um, so conditions of confinement, um, the other, area that I work on because I know so, 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 so many people who have this sentence, which is the sentence of life without the possibility of parole. And um, I have some statistics in that fact sheet about how many people in Massachusetts have that sentence, how few <clears throat> used to have it in the 70s. I don't remember, I don't have the number right in front of me, but like maybe 150 or something like that. And now it's like 11 or 1200 people out of about 7,800 people that are incarcerated in prisons in Massachusetts. So it's one of the highest in the country. And um, this is not because everybody's crimes have gotten so much worse. That's not what's driving it. What's driving it is the power of prosecutors, um, the professional victim rights organizations that are constantly, constantly, constantly trying to create longer sentences like three strikes. Um, and so all sentences for everything have gotten longer. And one of those categories is the sentence of life without the possibility of parole. And um, I know many, many, many people that have that that sentence. Uh, some of them really good friends of mine, two really close friends of mine, uh, die in prison with that sentence. Uh, one who was in prison he died at 85. He was in prison from more than 50 years um, and in Pennsylvania, which has an extraordinarily high rate of lifers. Um, and another friend who died in his 50s uh, of a heart attack um, who had that sentence. But I, I, I just know dozens and dozens of people who have that sentence. And, um, and so that got me interested in you know, the growth of that sentence and what it means to have a sentence of life. And um, also uh, some of the extraordinary people and the extraordinary work that those people have been able to do uh, despite that sentence. And if you go to the Real Cost Prisons website, there's a category there called writing from inside. <clears throat> and there's a lot of writing, amazing research and uh, amazing work uh, by lifers that are, that's up on that site. <clears throat> Many of those people are really good friends of mine. Um, I should just say, uh, so that's, so, and then the other thing, of course, that 
I became interested in is decarceration. <laughs> you know, like how to get more, how to get fewer people, why fewer people in prison for shorter periods of time. Um, and that, you know, is all kinds of things, you know, starting with bail and ending money bail and then going to the other end of that, ending life without the sentence of life without the possibility of parole. There are campaigns around the country. We have a campaign here in Massachusetts, a small one, but hopefully it'll be larger on ending life without parole. So last year in the legislature, there was a bill for that and there was for the first time a hearing on that bill and it didn't get out of committee just like everything else doesn't, but there were about 60 of us that testified at that hearing um, for that. And so that was a first for Massachusetts. Um, and, and then as part of decarceration, alternatives to incarceration. Um, and so there are all kinds of alternatives. And so it's that spectrum of decarceration that I do work in and um, just depending on what's happening where <laughs> and what the interest is and uh, some of my work is in Massachusetts and some of my work is uh, national like uh, uh, the life without parole work I'm connected to a lot of people all around the country who are also who have you know more let's say robust campaigns <laughs> to end life without parole than we do here in Massachusetts. Um, um, and then the other areas that I've been really interested in is um, Sean Hall is coming up in a month or so. He can talk more about this because he was a DA, um, uh, is the power of prosecutors. And the power of prosecutors has been uh, the thing more than anything that has really driven mass incarceration and the power of prosecutors uh, to extract plea bargains, uh, either with the hammer of mandatory minimums or with the hammer of uh, three strikes um, and the charging people with so many charges per, per crime that in a way the only alternative for people uh, unless they're really rich and have great lawyers is to accept a plea bargain. And um, you know, despite all the court shows, I mean, I don't watch any of these shows, but whatever they are, I don't know if that's Perry Mason, you know, that's my last frame of reference. But I mean, those kinds of shows, 95% um, uh, uh, of cases in the United States now are plea bargain. So all of these uh, shows that you see um, about, uh, trials and courts and lawyers doing fantastic things uh, is, is basically non-existent. So almost everything gets plea bargained and the power of the person to uh, uh, set the charges and then agree to the plea bargain is the DA. And so um, there are DAs in every county and uh, so they are, the drivers of mass incarceration. They have incredible, incredible power. And one way that they have so much power is nobody knows what they do, unless you end up in court with them or you end up having to being arrested and having to negotiate some kind of plea bargain. And that's who knows about them. But um, most people don't. I mean, here we have this sort of jolly DA you know, who always seems like such a great guy, Sullivan, you know, and, um, but he, he is a DA and, and that is who he is, despite this other thing that you see him publicly doing. And um, so that's um, another area that I do work in. The other area that I've been sort of like the leader of in Massachusetts is, um, opposing new jails and prisons. And uh, most states now are not trying to build new jails and prisons. Um, there was a huge building boom in the 90s and the early 2000s. And by and large, that's kind of leveled off as the prison population is leveled off. 
So like they built enough to, they built enough to incarcerate 2.3 million people. <laughs> That's what they built enough to do. And, um, and there are some uh, cities that have tried to build new jails, uh, but by and large, this boom, this huge boom in jail and prison building has stopped, except for one place that it still continues. And that place is Massachusetts. And um, so right now there, um, there's uh, plans to uh, build a new, well, it's like rehab a uh, prison for women to close down this old prison called Framingham, which is the prison for women in Massachusetts, and to rehab this other prison. Um, and so that's going on. And there's also been an effort for years, which has, I mean, it, it comes up constantly. It's, it's, it's ne it never dies. And, and that is to build a new jail for women and maybe men in Middlesex County. And um, so I have been uh, fighting, especially these jails uh, for years and years and years. Uh, this thing with uh, this new one uh, to replace Framingham has just popped up in the last year and a half. Um, and, uh, and so that's been one of the things that I always end up doing, even though I can't stand doing it anymore. It's because it's like the same people, the same. Uh, one of the things about Massachusetts that is very, very peculiar um, about jails is is that even though so in every other in in every other state the county jail is paid for by the taxpayers of the county. So the taxpayers have um, a vote in whether whether they want to raise taxes to pay for a jail. But in Massachusetts, because there is no county government really anymore, um, all of the money for new jails comes from the state. And so it's basically the, the sheriff and the state that agree on to whether to have a new jail in that county. So you have to, you have to fight, not just the sheriff, but you have to fight the bonding committee, you have to fight all of the legislators that is like, yeah, we'll vote for that, you know, because maybe one day we'll want a new jail in our county and we'll want you to vote for our new jail. So it's a, it's a much harder job uh, to try to resist it. And it's something, it's about bonds. And so it's something that doesn't happen as part of the the general budget of the state. So it all happens b behind the scenes. I always say the first thing that happens that you usually find out about is there's a picture in the paper of people with hard hats and shovels and they're digging a hole and it says new jail. And that's how you find out there's gonna be a new jail. And then the next picture you see is like a year and a half later and it's those same people and they're cutting the ribbon. And in any other state, I mean, in any other county, there would have to be hearings, there would have to be protests, or it could be protests, there could be some accountability of county commissioners um, in, that, in that county to the population. And so that's part of the uh, problem with, um, with trying to end or stop new jails, uh, especially in Massachusetts. Prisons, same thing only it's all the Department of Correction, but it's all happens like behind this veil. And you have to figure out like how to get behind the veil. I do have to say, since here at Amherst, that Mindy Dom is on the bonding committee. And um, when I first saw that she was appointed to the bonding committee, I like, I wrote her immediately. <laughs> she was like, you know, she was just finding out about it. I mean, and, and, uh, you know, I, I've spent so much time trying to deal with people in that office and the bonding committee. And there was a hearing on the bond, which was one of the first. And actually, I think partly because of Mindy, uh, 
usually they don't have public here. They'll have a hearing, but they, you can't, you can't, there's no testimony. You can't be, in, there's, you, there's no public testimony. You know, the people that want to, the, like the, the sheriff presents or the Department of Correction presents, but the public, there's just, you don't, there's nothing. You don't get, you get to sit there and listen to it. <laughs> so um, in this last thing, the last round of the bond for uh, this, uh, which would be for prison and jail building, that I was actually invited to testify myself and one other person, which was a first. And Mindy, you know, like I gave Mindy all of these questions and gave her all of this stuff to read. And um, so she was really prepared. And there was another person, a new person on that committee with her uh, who wasn't like totally in the pocket of the Department of Correction. And so it was a different, it was like the first experience. It was a different experience. As it, as it turns out, the bond got passed anyway, because this is the way it works. But um, uh, and it happened like at the last minute. We thought we were winning, 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 winning. And then in the Ways and Means Committee, uh, somebody put in this little extra sentence that allowed the bond to be used for uh, jails and prisons. And and that's what we were left. That's what we're left with. So that's that's the way that goes. Um, anyway, that's that's what I do. Well, that's um, there's so many more more questions to be asked about all those things, mm -hmm. um, and uh, we've got we've got questioners actually. Uh, Jane Pearl is we all brainstorm questions, and uh, Jane's going to take over and okay. keep the conversation going. All right, I'm, I'm now. I feel I'm just talking, talking. Oh, good. Well, I anyway, know, but anyway, okay. Hi, Lois. This is great. I mean, it's just exhausting uh, how much you cover and and how much more there is to do. Um, so everything. I, yeah. <laughs> so I want to start by asking you a little bit about legislation. I think there are five or six bills that have been up in the last session and none of them got through as far as I, I know. Um, but I think one is has survived to, to be in the next session. Is that the one on bail? No. Uh, Oh, telephones, telephones, telephones. It, it, it's not. It's not in the next session. It just hasn't died yet. The session oh. isn't over, um, uh, uh, and so uh, usually the session ha will have ended. But because of COVID, it's still like it's like in its last mm -hmm. gasp, so to speak. And uh, uh, so it's not dead yet. Uh, but that doesn't mean that it's not going to. Uh, it doesn't mean that it'll pass. It just means it's not dead yet. Uh, that list that I sent out, which was from PLS, uh, it was bill after bill after bill about parole, about um, life without parole. Uh, it was, you know, that whole huge list. None of those bills, none of them got out of committee. So what do you think is the main bottleneck um, or political uh, problem that just doesn't let any of this go through? Uh, well, uh, a, a number of things. I mean, the first thing I would say at the top of my list is it's a complete, almost a complete, not that this is necessarily a criteria, but it's the legislature is, I don't know, like 90% white. Mm. And, um, and not just the legislature, if you go to the state house, you feel like you've entered, you've been dropped into 1958. Hmm. You know, it's, it is such a weird environment and it's a uh, very, 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 I mean, even though now the president of the Senate is a woman, um, Spilka, and there are some, you know, women legislators, um, it's such a, a, a white male environment and such a, a Boston centric, um, I would say Catholic environment. Uh, like, you know, everybody comes in a very, out of a very particular uh, worldview. They all grew up like, you know, in a certain radius, like from Boston, maybe 35 miles or something. And um, they all grew up in these 
white neighborhoods and they go to white schools and then they go to white colleges and then they go to white law schools and then they become uh, prosecutors and then they run for the legislature and they become legislators. So, I mean, to say parochial, it doesn't even begin to capture it. Mm -hmm. um, they are so backward. And the other thing about them is they live in Massachusetts and they think, and especially the ones that are from the Boston area, they think they're the best, the smartest, that they can't learn anything from what's happening in any other state, um, what any other legislator legislature is doing. They're they're from Massachusetts, you know, so that um, it, it just doesn't matter. Like you can't bring in somebody from someplace that's doing a thousand times better at a hearing and they would even give a damn. They wouldn't give a damn because they're from some other state. Like it could be Texas or it could be even New York, you know? Um, and so they just, they just have such disregard for uh, anything outside of this tiny little uh, white um, male uh, circle. And um, it's really, I mean, you just feel it when you're in there and you feel it when you have to deal with them. Well, so, you, yeah, I mean, so that's like the, that's like the, the so, so, so they don't know people that are in prison. They don't know families that are in prison. They are family members. They're so detached from this that. And they don't hear from people like you all that this is important to you as a white person in Amherst, you know, that this has meaning to you in the same way as solar energy does, mm -hmm. you know, or whatever, you know, but whatever has meaning to people, special meaning to people in Amherst or Northampton or whatever, Western Mass. Mm -hmm. And um, they just don't, they just don't hear anybody or if they do it's like you know um uh uh so um that's that's the basis of it and you know you go to these hearings and uh, you know there could be like a judiciary committee like a joint committee and there could be like 25 of them or something on there and uh and when you look at them, they're literally almost asleep. I mean, I don't mean they, I mean like they're literally almost sleeping during a hearing. And those are the ones that are there. Mostly they're not there. So they're not even there to hear, you know, everybody puts all this energy into these hearings. It's, it's just this performance uh, because you have to show up, you have to perform, but really it, it's, it's totally a performance on the part of the people. I'm often one of those people uh, being the performer and you know you can't show disinterest but there's really no nothing really happens and so legislation uh, doesn't get moved um, <clears throat> and if anything passes um, two years ago in April uh, there was this thing called the Criminal Justice Reform Act or CJRA and it basically did nothing it just tinkered around the edges of these, all of these really big issues. And what they said about it is that this was the most significant legislation in a generation. And I said, well, yes, because nothing's been done in a generation. So you, you, if you knew the magic bullet, you know, to break through all this, I'm sure you would have done that. But there you must have some thoughts on what resources you mentioned you know hearing from people like us so how how would you harness those of us who would want to be come involved in trying to break through these log jams well i think some of it is um you know you know i mean there'll be a new legislative session mm -hmm. you know and there'll be bills i mean next 
week or whatever it is, a couple of weeks, there's going to start being meetings about, <clears throat> you know, what what kind of legislation do people think, you know, from last time to try to keep to introduce again. And one of the things that I've been trying to talk to people about is there are all of these issues. I mean, there's everything, right? There's like the complete everything that needs to be dealt with, every single everything. But uh, what happens, and this is especially true in Massachusetts, is a lot of the work has been driven by dealing with the legislature and these particular pieces of legislation. And and so it ends up being very, I mean, I'll just use this word, even though I'll, I'll just use a different word, compartmentalized. I won't say siloed, um, compartmentalized. And so, you know, the the 10 people that are interested in life without parole work on that bill. And then the 10 people that are into five people that work on changing the parole board work on that. And then the telephone people work on the telephone and the anti-jail building people work on the anti-jails, you know. And so everybody is very, very, very segmented. And um, because what happens is in Massachusetts, because there is no base, there is no base of organizing that's going on, community organizing, not just here, but in almost every place in the state. I mean, there's some tiny example exceptions like Bristol County, which has this lunatic for a sheriff. And so everybody's very like pe more people are organized there. I mean, he's a he's like the main Trump sheriff. He's like our pio only. He's replaced our pio, and he's in Bristol County in in Massachusetts. And his name is Hodgson. He's really a horrible guy. So people there are more organized. So there's actually an organizing base of people, but in most of Massachusetts there is no organizing base. And so what people end up responding to is these individual pieces of legislation. And people, I mean, I, I work on individual pieces of legislation too, because I get pulled into it and I, I can't, it's like, I can't stop myself. Just, I, I mean, every session I think I'm not gonna do it and then every session I do it. So, but still more and more at what I've been trying to talk to people about around the state in these various you know, meetings that happen is, is that how can we create more of an organizing base and that the legislation and the support for the legislation comes out of that base, like from the bottom instead of the top. And the places that are successful around the country that I do work with where, where I see this is that's the way it happens. It doesn't start with legislation. It starts with people who are impacted by what is going on. Either they've been in the criminal legal system, they've been incarcerated or their families are, or you know they have this connection. And, and that's where the organizing starts. And then eventually there's they, they, they either write or start producing legislation and find legislators to support it and try to actually move legislation. And by the time they have the, by the time they're doing that, they have the ability to move legislation because there's a base that it comes from. And so the places that I see where that's really happening, like in New York state around release, there's a great group called RAP, Release Aging Prisoners, or there's a great one in Philly uh, called CADBE, uh, Coalition to End Death by Incarceration. Um, there's, a, there's a statewide ending life without parole organization in, in California. And it starts at the people that are impacted. And here, for many different reasons, that isn't what has happened. And, um, and it's really, it's, it's very uh, problematic. It's very, very, very problematic. And um, uh, and so um, that's that's part of the thing. All of this is to say, I'm not saying that if there's, I mean, because I do it too, you know, if there's legislation that people need to hear from people, you know, I mean, 
Um, and, you know, whether it's Mindy or Joe Comerford or my rep, Lindsay Sabadosa, who has been absolutely has become, even though she just started, same time as Mindy, Joe, she's become one of the leaders in the, in the legislature uh, uh, on, on really working against mass incarceration in this very personal, great way. She's gone to prison. She's met with people. She's connected with people. She's, you know, she's gotten really connected. I mean, I was just emailing her right before this meeting about that. And, um, and there's just this tiny little group of them uh, in, in, in the state house, just a tiny little group of them. And there needs to be more. And the only way there's gonna be more is for people to understand that their constituents think it's important. Mm -hmm. You know, like they hear from them. Sure. And it can't, you know, like when I write to Mindy, you know, I, I, I feel like I'm the only one that's writing to her. She's not even my rep. I mean, it's just, I know her, but I mean, she's not my rep. Um, and, and you know, anyway, so I, I think it's, it's a very complicated uh, picture, partly, you know, where the population center is, where the most legislators come from, all of that, what their backgrounds are, as I said, which are just, you know, antithetical to actually doing anything. The way the legislature is set up, there's uh, DeLeo, who's the Speaker of the House, has basically complete control over the legislature, mm -hmm. both the House and the Senate side, even though he's not, doesn't have anything to do with the Senate. It's up to him to decide what comes out of committees. It's up to him to decide whatever comes up for a vote. He has control of that place. And that's the way the setup is. And if you have somebody like him or who the other ones were, other, all the other ones, you know, before him, um, that that's really an impediment to change because there are people that they are people that do not want change. Not just on this, but on like, you know, a lot of other things. Yes. A lot of other things. So and I'm, so this is just one of them. Yeah. So I'm hearing that there at least there's many things that we can do, but uh, it seems like one of the things we need to do is to make these legislators and uh, and sheriffs and DAs uh, to force them to have contact to see, to know how what the real cost of prisons as you define it uh, are on the communities and not just the families and and prisoners themselves, and that it needs to start from the bottom. Um, that I mean, I, I just have to say, I mean, I think that. You know the DAs are very aware about what they do and their impact on what they do. It's not like they're oblivious. They want to do what they're doing. That's their job. Okay. You know, I mean, so that's that's their job. I mean, the sheriff's job is to keep people locked up. That's what he's doing. Mm -hmm. You know, and that is what they do. I mean, some are doing it in a slightly better way than some others, but I mean, it's not about it's not about convincing them that you know, they're not doing the right thing. They feel like they are doing the right thing. <laughs> you know, so I mean, the legislatures then. Yeah, well, and also to say, um, well, like, here's an example. I don't know if you saw this thing that was in the paper about this so-called restorative justice uh, program that the DA and the police have initiated in six cities and towns. It's Northampton, Amherst, two of them. And uh, I mean, at the, they're, they're, I have never heard other than this nonprofit called C4RJ or something like that, that goes around working with police departments and DAs. Other than them, I have never ever heard of a restorative justice program come out of the police department and the DA. It's it's antithetical to restorative justice. They're the prosecutors. They're the people doing the arresting. They're having cops sitting in and these, you know, so-called restorative justice circles. The cops choose who should be in the in the in get restorative justice. Restorative justice in, in every other community that or every other program that I have ever, ever heard of 
or know about comes from the community, not from the police and the DA. <laughs> so how can, how can we harness that and 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 build on that? Well, I, I think they shouldn't do it. I don't want to harness it or build on it. I think if if they if people want to have a restorative justice program in Amherst, then the community should figure meet with people that know how to do it and are restorative justice practitioners and create a restorative justice program and say bye to the police and say bye to the DA. And the way this has happened is it co-ops this idea, it like the idea of restorative justice and puts them at the center of it instead of the people who have been harmed and the people that have done harm. It said it puts the DA in the, you know, so I mean, that to me is like, say, oh, listen, you know, we're really not in favor of this. We're really not, we don't really want to have city or town money go toward this fake um, DA and police controlled restorative justice. What, I mean, restorative justice in quotes uh, program. I thought so, it was a good thing, but now I see what you're saying. In in light of all the all this, the problems that you've identified and outlined, um, it I, I think you're not. Correct me if I'm wrong, but I think you're not in favor of actually abolishing the prison system. I as, am a hundred percent in favor of abolishing the prison system as we know it. Well, not prisons. Then you're not there. I I am I. Correct that you you do believe that there are some dangerous people who need to be locked up, but that the system is the problem, not not the, like the defund the police uh, movement. You're not saying let's defund everything, but let's re envision. Is that correct? I'm saying I'm saying um, if it costs. Uh, billions and billions and billions of dollars to create, keep the criminal legal system as it does as it is now right mm -hmm. i mean one of the one of the uh just statistics that you should know is like i'm sure everybody here remembers like 1972 right we all remember that 1970 1972 it it those um, during those years, there were 200,000 people in prison. Total, jail in prison, total, in 1972. Now, there are 2.3 million people in prison. There are as many women in prison now as there were the whole number of people that were incarcerated in, in 1972. And that has been this exponential growth in the prison system and in everything that goes with it, lawyers, courts, cops, all the equipment, everything about it, right? That is, that keeps that system going. And what I'm saying is, um, let's work on bringing the prison and jail population down to where it was in 1972. Let's get rid of 2 million people, right? Let's get rid of those 2 million people. Let's find another place for them to be that actually could be helpful. Let's take some of those billions and billions and billions of dollars and put it in education, put it in health care, put it in mental health care, put it in substance use systems, do all of the things that we that we could invest in, that we could reallocate instead of defund, reallocate all of that money, billions and billions and billions of dollars. I mean, in Massachusetts, the prison system is $1.2 billion. For what? Yeah, I, I, like, think what I, read, was, I think I read that it was the largest line item on the, the state the state budget. Uh, no, it's close to a higher education. I know that. It's, it's the same as higher education. 
So let's, but I mean, so this is just one of 50, right? What we have here, this one, our, our system. Let's out, reallocate that money into something that is useful, something that is corrective, if we want to talk about corrections, yeah. rather than um, what it is that we are investing in now. And so we need to be able to parole people. We need to have shorter sentences. We need to have bail reform. So people, every jail, three quarters of the people there are locked up because they can't make bail, right? We need to have bail reform or get rid of money bail completely. You know, all of these things that I mentioned that are decarceration. And so to me, decarceration is the road to abolition. Mm -hmm. I'm not saying, I, I mean, I think he's dead now, but I, I always used to say, well, okay, let's keep Charles Manson locked up. You know, I mean, let's find the people that really need to be locked up. But most people do not need to be locked up for 20 or 30 or 40 or 50 years. And that's people always say, oh, you know, like, how come we need so many prisons? And I said, well, because we don't let anybody go. If we let people go, or we locked up fewer of them, or instead of locking somebody up for 15 years, you lock them up for five years the way they do, like in, you know, most Western European countries, not 20 years, then then we would be on the road to abolition. Yes, there's be crime, but if we invested more money in things that actually are crime prevention, then there could be less crime. <laughs> Guess what? There would be less need for prisons. There would be less need for jails if we reinvested in a completely other thing than, way, than how we're set up to do this now which we're, all we're set up to do now is to arrest people, to plea bargain them, and to stick them in jails and prisons. That's what the system is set up to do. When you're in there, it's not like anything good happens to you. You yeah, know, I mean, you'd think that there would be some, you know, more effort put into training and, and, and job placement and affordable housing so that there wouldn't be so much recidivism um, I mean, I mean, even the recidivism, I looked up this number because can I can um, find it. Uh, oh, yeah. So in Massachusetts, 78% of the people that violate parole are there for parole violation. They didn't commit another crime. They, you know, they peed in a cup and they had drugs in their in their pee, or they missed a meeting, or or they missed two meetings, and they had their parole violated. Seventy eight percent, and they went back to prison. So even the idea of recidivism is a scare a scare word. Mm -hmm. Oh my God! Oh, seventy eight percent of the people that we let out are returned to prison. Where are they? people out of control, animals, you know, like what is it that would make 78% of people end up back in prison? Well, you know, one of the things that you can't do if you're on parole is, is be around somebody else who's on parole. Well, if you're on parole, my guess is that you know quite a lot of people that could be on parole too. And if you're a uh, parole officer wants to violate you, they can send you back to prison. I know people that this happened to for being in contact with somebody else who's on parole. Mm -hmm. But when you look at this number and you think 78% of people, all these people are being returned to prison, you know, what's wrong with them? Yeah. Well, what's wrong with them is the system that is some people on parole in every place are on parole for their whole entire lives. Wow. So that means everything about their life is controlled by a parole officer who can show up where they work, 
who can show up where they live, who can demand that they a drug test, who can, 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 can. Look at, see who they're hanging out with, see them on a corner and not like it. So maybe for your whole lifetime, but maybe for five years or maybe for 10 years, which means you can be violated, which means you can go back to prison, which means the prisons get filled up. So, I mean, there are so, I mean, but when you look at it and you think, oh God, this is terrible. These people must be really terrible people. It's the system. It's the system. And, and I think when you know how the system works, you feel you feel less into this trap. It's like, oh my God, prison abolition. We're going to have you know murderers and rapists like marauding all over the 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 town. And that that isn't it. And I mean, to me, I mean, I I will say this that, I mean, and people find it shocking, but it's true. I know many people who have killed somebody. They're serving life without the possibility of parole for a murder, one murder that was done when they were out of their minds or crazy or whatever, drug, blah, 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 blah. And to me, when I say everybody get, should get a chance to be paroled, to go before a parole board, that people should not be incarcerated for their lifetime that people change. I mean, hopefully we all changed from the time we were 20 to the age we are now. So do you see any models out there that you feel might be replicable here? And- um, mean here in Massachusetts? Massachusetts. And where do we start? Well, I think one way to start is to actually like know what is going on you know, and not um, be so susceptible to like the stuff that's on TV, you know, if it bleeds, it leads, you know, I mean that, all the cop shows, I mean, I don't know if you watch them, I, I don't watch any of that, so, but I mean, but still all of these movies, I mean, just even seeing the coming attractions of movies, you know, of people and who they are and think and try to think about who who is there, who are we locking up? Why are we locking people up for, for this? You know, and what all are, are, are the alternatives? I mean, there are systems, you know, I mean, people always use Norway as an example. I mean, Norway, that first of all, mo no Western country has a Western European country has a sentence of life without the possibility of parole. We're, we're the only ones that have it. We are the outlier. And of course, there's, you know, tens of thousands of people that have this sentence. And I think that Norway is more of a homogeneous population. Well, yes, but also everything about it, there's less crime. Why? Because not just that it's homogeneous, it's a welfare state. You know, people have health care, people have good education, people have places to live that aren't that have heat. People can get food. You know, I mean, everything about the system is different. So it creates a different reality. And then when people are, do commit a crime and they are, the idea is, is to normalize prison with the outside as much as possible. Mm -hmm. that, pr so that prison experience is, gets normalized. People can, after whatever it is, a year, a year, go out to work, come back, do all of these things. We used to be able to do that. The people used to be furloughed. Willie Horton was furloughed. Mm -hmm. I mean, really, <laughs> but, you know, <laughs> but we used to have, I mean, I know people that are old enough that have been locked up long enough that uh, were, were furloughed. They would go out and have jobs and they would come back to Norfolk prison. And now they're in their 80s and they're still sitting there. And I mean, the other thing that I should say about Norfolk prison, just because this is why I was writing to Lindsay is there's a huge, huge, Norfolk prison has the oldest prison population in the state. And there is a huge outbreak of COVID there. More than a hundred people have been infected with COVID as of today. And I, I mean, or yesterday, but I mean, I don't know what the full number is yet. 
and what they have done with them is, and I have to say, I have a lot of good friends in there, um, is they have put them in a part of the prison that they closed down a year ago because it was completely, um, I don't know, infected or whatever with mold. Mm. So that is where they have put people, 100 people at least, in a big dorm that's filled with mold that's been closed for a year with a re who are old with respiratory disease, COVID. And so that is what is happening right now in Massachusetts at Norfolk Prison. And we can't get anybody in the Department of Correction, anybody in the State House, really. Uh, Mary Lou Sutters is the head of Health and Human Services, uh, the head of the DOC, none of them to respond to what's going on there. And um, that is horrible and a crisis and very, very, very. Lois, I have to. Uh interrupt as, as a timekeeper I mean, oh, sorry. to this issue. And I want to get to the questions in the chat. Um, oh, I have been looking and I'm talking so much. No, but, well, I mean, this is just a, just a small amount of time for this whole enormous issue. I do want to make sure that we capture some ideas um, for what volunteers could do. What people. Right, right. I, I made up a list, actually. Let me go through the list. Uh, 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 do, do legislators in the eastern part of the state care? <laughs> Not really. But I mean, there are legislators here, you know, and they should be educated themselves and they should be contacted. I mean, I don't know if DeLeo cares about it, but I mean, we do, unfortunately, all share the same governor. You know who is not given a damn. I mean, the thing about this, just back to this, sorry, this thing about the COVID thing. So there has been um, so eight months. The DOC has not made put one plan in place for how to deal with this. So this is how they're dealing with it by just shoving everybody in this room. Um, uh, some relationship to the Black Lives Matter or the people in the communities where there, where there are a lot of prisoners coming from those communities could be a base for organizing. Yes, I mean, one thing that is very interesting even here is um, there is a disconnect between Black Lives Matter and policing. Yeah. And then it sort of stops at policing. And I said to the Black Lives Matter people here, well, what do you think the police do? They arrest people. And some of those people go to prison. You know, that there, there's and and there's the police, there's the DA, and there are jails and prisons. You know, and it's important for the Black Lives Matter people, not just here, but everywhere. I, to look at this continuum of, you know, it starts with racist policing and it ends up with what? This disproportionate number of black and brown people that are incarcerated. You know, I mean, they don't get there by, they don't just walk in on their own. You know, they starts with policing and, but, and then the DAs and then incarceration. So, I mean, it's, it's interesting to me um, there was a group, this decarcerate group, not decarcerate, the Black Lives Matter group here. They sent me this thing about uh, there was going to be a rally or something, and I didn't want to go because I didn't want to be around 20 people. And um, and it was about Black Lives Matter, and I said, you know, you didn't mention anything about mass incarceration. And they were like, oh. And I said, and they said, well, would you write something about that? And I was like, yeah, I'd be glad to write something about that, you know, and somebody would read it because I thought, can you have a, actually have a Black Lives Matter rally without talking about mass incarceration? And the answer is, yes, you can, you know. Um, it is, it's less visible. We see the police and we, um, and now we have video cameras and we have yeah. that same. Less exactly. Exactly. Yeah. You're not meant to see jails and prisons. They're stuck in the middle of nowhere. I mean, mostly they are. 
Let's go to the chat now and see what. Oh, and I just want to make my suggestions. Let me make the suggestions that I wrote down. Okay. Uh, so, uh, well, one of them is, you know, to question the police and the DA about this bogus restorative justice thing, which I think is just horrible. Um, it, it is an aberration. I think, you know, you've connected to the racial equity task force, I think, to continue working with them and to see a ways to interface with what they're doing and what you might want to do. Um, the other thing that I mentioned to you, Jamie, when we were talking about some of these things is <clears throat> there's uh, an or there are organizations throughout the country and basically they're called book through bars or something like that. And, and what they do is they uh, collect used books and then people who are incarcerated write to them and say, I want a book on, I don't know, yoga. And it, hopefully they have a book on yoga that somebody donated to them and they send them the book on yoga. And there's one in Turner's Falls it's called Great Falls Books Through Bars. And it started a few years ago. I mean, they always need books on yoga and other things, but you know, I, they have to be paperbacks. It can't be hardbacks because prisons won't lack hardback books in for fear that something terrible will happen with them. And, um, uh, and the other good thing about it is aside from the, you know, the books and is if you do that, what you do is you open mail and read letters from people who are incarcerated. And um, I mean, I, I get mail from prisoners, not just prisoners I know, but prisoners I don't know every single day. So every day I open mail from prisoners and every day I answer mail from prisoners every single day. And it is a good way. That's how I know what I know. Mail from prisoners. I mean, that's how I started. Mail from prisoners. And so it has, you know, it's it's a way to connect with people who are behind bars. So there's that. Great Falls. The other thing is Great Falls Books Through Bars. Uh, the other thing is uh, this, we just finished. I don't know what the upshot of it is, but we did this project uh, of uh, people who are in, in jail, who are there pretrial or who are there for misdemeanors or who are civilly committed. I didn't even get into that, which is a whole other disgusting thing that goes on uh, here. Um, uh, they, they're eligible to vote. People who are uh, convicted of felonies are not allowed to vote. And um, so this year we had this project of getting working with law, the law clerk in the jails to get people ballots and request ballots and fill out ballots and vote. And so um, it was good. It didn't happen in every county. It only happened in counties where people were interested in doing it, you know, but we did it here. I don't think it really ever happened in Springfield. It happened in Franklin County. It didn't happen in Berkshire County just because there weren't volunteers to do it. But the group itself is, is gonna keep going because um, uh, in, in 2000, um, Massachusetts voted to take away the right to vote of people who are convicted of felonies in prisons. Up until that point, Maine, Vermont, and Massachusetts were the states that allowed it. And then um, Paul Salucci was the acting governor. And actually, a lot of these guys I know at Norfolk, where this COVID thing is going on now, started a political action committee. And Salucci went crazy. And uh, he managed to get on the ballot um, a question about whether people who are had felonies and were in prison should be disenfranchised. And 60% of the progressive people of Massachusetts voted to disenfranchise people who were in prison. 
And it was and is the only time people in Massachusetts voted to take away the rights of another group of people. And so that law is still there. And there have been various kind of efforts to try to work to overturn that law, get a new question on the ballot and try to uh, re-enfranchise people who are uh, disenfranchised because they have felony convictions in prison. And so that is something that, so this ballot access thing was one thing, but it's gonna continue. So if people are interested in that, that's another thing. And then um, the other thing is is just, you know, being aware, finding out, and I'll be glad to, I mean, tell people when things start happening uh, about legislation that's upcoming. And then the other thing that I mentioned to uh, Jamie is that maybe some of you know about this organization that's in Boston, it's called GBIO, Greater Boston Interfaith Organization. It's a big, big organization in Boston with, I don't know how many, it's churches and mosques and synagogues and you know, like everybody in this big organization, they have a criminal justice part and they're very powerful. They're, pow they're a powerful organization. I mean, as these kinds of organizations go in Massachusetts. And, um, and I mentioned them just because, um, not that you would join GBIO, mm -hmm. but maybe to think about doing using them as a model for Amherst or for Western Mass or for Northampton and Amherst or whatever, as uh, they, they do, you know, lobbying, they do programs, they do, you know, all these kinds of things. And they're, they're based in the various, mm -hmm. you know, churches and synagogues and stuff that, that, um, that they come out of. And, and they're they're very they're I don't know when they started but they're they're a very good group I know the woman who's I think co-chair of it named Bev Williams and um, so just throw that out there as a possibility for something to do um, that I think yeah. that's good it, yeah it's always a challenge Western Mass we're just you know so we never have critical mass for things to get the attention of people in Boston. Um, so I think that's an interesting idea about um, uh, bridging that gap. So Gita Swain, what have we got from the chat? Have you got some questions there? Oh, sorry. Oh, let's see. Uh, public, private, prisons, differences, anything to teach us. Uh, well, there, there are no private prisons in Massachusetts. And the reason for that is we have a very, 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 very powerful guards union yeah. and um, private prisons don't pay well and uh, prison guards in the state prisons make at least $100,000 a year and uh, they don't want private prisons there they're suddenly their income would drop to maybe $50,000 a year. And so that is a big, big incentive for them. And they're very powerful, uh, uh, a lobby. Police are very powerful lobby and the prison guards are very powerful lobby in the legislature. And they will keep private prisons and states that have really powerful unions. Uh, I mean, California is a little bit of an exception, but don't have private prisons uh, because they don't want them. Um, there, even though we don't have private prisons, we have private health care, which is, I have to say, health care is in quotes. And um, we have private phone companies. Uh, I think it's this year, 20 or $24 million of uh, family members have gone to pay for phone calls just in Massachusetts, family members people who are the least, least, least able to, like $3.15 for a 15 minute call, um, and then extra connecting charges and all of that. Um, and so uh, that's privatized 
everything in jails, in prisons, basically, is privatized, um, except the prisons and jails themselves. And so the focus is, you know, that's why this telephone thing is so important. And um, just to be so that the jails are not all the jails, all the sheriffs get commissions off all the money, the Department of Corrections, basically, you know, and what the what the sheriffs say is, oh, we need this money for programs. Well, this, you know, the jails have a budget of more than half a billion dollars a year. And the DOC has 700, 700 million and 2% of it or 3% of it they put towards programs. So if they wanted to, they could put more money toward programs and they shouldn't have programs off the back of family members that are paying for these outrageous amounts of money for telephone calls so they can connect. And that's all privatized. So it's important to look at where where things are actually happening here. And, and, and in the United States, only 10% of prisons for citizens, not the ICE prisons, but citizens, are privatized. So that's like 200,000 people and the other 2 million are in city, state, county jails. So the privatized, the private prisons is like, you know, the thing that everybody wants to like rally around. But if we close down all of those ones for citizens, not the ICE ones, but the, you know, they would just go to all the regular city, state, and county jails. It's not like, you know, like everybody would be let out of the private prisons. And, you know, they could go home. They would go to the prisons that exist. So it's it's sort of like the wrong focus, you know, I think. And people always want to talk about it because it's bad to profit off prisons, but everybody's profiting off prisons anyway. You know, everybody is. The people that work in them, the, all the services, the health, the phones, everything, the shoes, the guns. You know, so, all of that. Less. So Lois, Lois, can I ask you a, 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 a follow up question? These suggestions, I mean, your information is overwhelming and fantastic. Can you just say, are there any actions going on that are more local, either about Hampshire County Jail or about Hampshire County that you think we could get involved in? Because I think the closer to home, the more we have contacts, the more we have influence. And it, it doesn't feel like we have a lot of influence with people like DeLeo and Karen Spilka, but we do have some influence out here in Western Mass. So my question is, are there any initiatives out here that we could become a part of? Mm -hmm. Well, unfortunately, this voting thing just ended because uh, that we just finished doing it because of the election, you know, and um, and so I would say, I mean, a lot of those things that I mentioned, book through bars, continuing with the voting project, um, you know, this stupid restorative justice thing, you know, which I think is so destructive, uh, you know, all of that. And I mean, so yeah, it's true. We don't have any, any um, say with Spilka, but, some of our people that are here do, like I wrote to Joe Comerford about a couple of days ago about uh, what's going on at Norfolk, which is, I mean, I, I mean, that's just horrible what's going on there. And uh, of course, I haven't gotten almost any attention at all. And because who cares a damn about them anyway. And, and she wrote to Spilka, you know, and, um, and so I also, of course, wrote to Lindsay and Lindsay is having a meeting tomorrow, I think, with Jamie Eldridge, who's the chair of the Judiciary Committee and who's a very good guy, mm -hmm. Senator, and Joe and Lindsay, and I don't know who else, maybe Lindsay was trying to convince him to invite more people about what's going on at Norfolk. So yeah, it's true that, you know, if I write to Karen Spilka, you know, she's like, you know, what, but if, if Joe, um, uh, right, if you write to her and say, listen, you know, this is horrible. Um, 
And it's also bad for just Massachusetts. I mean, it's going to be like the soldiers home all over again. So are you recommending that it, at this moment in time that we all write to Karen Skips Bilka and say you need no, to do No, I'm it. recommending you write to Mindy and Joe. Okay. And say, I heard this and this is horrible. And what what is the governor going to do? What is Mary Lou Sutter going to do? What is the DOC? What's the plan? I see. What's That's helpful. Plan? And let them let them know you're you're concerned about this. You know about it. You're concerned about it. I mean, one thing I should mention is I don't know how many of you use Facebook, but the Real Cuts of Prisons has a Facebook page, and uh, I've been posting stuff. You know, there's been a couple of articles on this Commonwealth magazine about um, what's going on at Norfolk. Not a lot, but I mean, anything that I mean, there hasn't been that much written about it, of course but maybe something will be. And so that, I mean, I post stuff on that, not just about uh, Massachusetts, about what's going on around the country, but I always post stuff about what's going on in Massachusetts. You know, I mean, Prisoners Legal Services, which is a fantastic organization. Um, it's like legal aid for prisoners, but they do legislative stuff and they do individual advocacy. I mean, they filed a lawsuit last Friday, like basically saying, what are you doing? Like they already had filed lawsuits after lawsuits about COVID. And I mean, Lindsay uh, filed a bill like right in the beginning of COVID, which I actually was started with a conversation, a radio interview that the two of us did together, like right in the beginning of it about things that could happen. And she ended up writing this fantastic bill. And guess what? The bill never got out of committee. And it was all of the different kinds of steps jails and prisons could do to decarcerate so that we wouldn't be in the spot that we're in now. And, and, and I can't remember how many, you know, out of 200, maybe like 40 people signed on to it. So, you know, I mean, but still it's important. I don't know if there are people in the JCA that aren't, amorous people, you know, like if they have other reps um, or other senators, even lesser, you know, he's bad. And, you know, if people have him as their senator, it would be good for people to connect with him. I mean, he would probably be surprised. Yeah, Dan Carey, exactly. That's a good pathway. We, um, I think we should really let our reps know how much we care about this issue. And Absolutely. we have put in action on the phone bill uh, in for the whole congregation, someone to write and so forth. Some of those, some of those would be really symbolic, I think, if you got made some progress on that and meaningful to people, families, and so forth. Oh, if it passed, it would be fantastic. Yeah. yeah. It would be amazing if it passed. Absolutely amazing. Focus. It wouldn't be symbolic at all. It would be really awesome. this huge weight off people's shoulders. Oh. A huge, so, huge weight. So Lois, what's the easiest way for us as a group or and we're the group that then communicates to the larger community to be kept up to date on your legislative actions? Is it through the website? Is it through the Facebook page? Or do you what what's well, one the easiest bills, way without Without bugging you, what's the easiest yeah, way yeah. for us to know I mean, what we should be doing? Yeah, what, right now we're in this like, you know, limbo, right? Yeah. This would be the budget and then they wait and then they all get together and there's this filing bills and all of that. Uh, um, so once that starts happening, just like that list that I sent everybody, the PLS, you know, like, I mean, they'll have bills, different different people will have different organizations. Well, I'll put out one, a list, you know, like I always put out a good bill and bad bill list and, mm -hmm. you know, so, uh, cause there's always, you know, like a lot of bad bills mm -hmm. and, um, and, you know, like I, I can send it to whoever, you know, I mean, Susan and I sometimes in touch and, yeah. Well, yeah, I think and, if you send you know, it to, so. to Jamie, that would be the best person right okay. now. It's not happening now. No, I understand. I understand. Yeah, this is like the next time this legislature goes into session. Um, so um, that um, I would say, I do and, think it's and, you know, and if you see, I mean, if there's, I mean, I can send. I posted it on the Facebook page. This thing about 
that came out uh, uh, about Norfolk uh, a couple of days ago. I don't think there's been a newer one, but I could I could send it uh, to um, uh, to Jamie, and you could send it to people. Uh, just and then to write oh, yeah. to reps and, and send it. I mean, if Joe's gonna go, Joe actually. I mean, she. I have to say, I mean. She did write me back like right away, and she wrote, and she's very, very connected to Spilka. She really, she is very connected to Spilka, and and that's that's good for us. Mm -hmm. you know? I mean, so. Um, well, we have to um, bring this to an end. Okay. Uh, <laughs> it's, it's just an end to this conversation. I mean, I hope we're creating a relationship with you and that we'll be um, finding ways to uh, latch onto a project or a feed that we can be activated. Um, we will uh, make the links, the information um, available again, to the rest of the congregation. And this will be on Amherst Media. I don't know, we'll see how many people. Okay, okay. maybe people but, will tune um, in. I mean, already I have, a, I, my complete lack of awareness of, of Massachusetts prisons, paying no, no attention is, is different. I think that's certainly true for everybody on our committee. So Great. I am so grateful to, for you for spending this time and for doing your work. I, I, if we had more time, I want to ask you, what keeps you going? It's such a discouraging picture. The people I know in prison. I kind of guessed. Yeah. Well, that's a, they have a powerful ally and a, and a steady, steadfast one. And a friend. And a friend. Yeah. 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 Thank you so much, Lois. Well, thank you all. All right. Thanks, Lois. Okay. okay.